Mai te pei au ki te au marama tihei Māori ora. Ka whakahoa le tia to tātou kingi a kingi tūhei te a pota tau te whero whero te tua whitu. Nei rā wā kumihi ki a koutou te whare o pota tau, tainui waka, tainui tangata tēnā koutou pai māriri. Wā kumihi ki a koutou hoki i ngā taringa are are o e nei kōrero, Māori ora ki a koutou katoa. Tutoa mai i runga, tutoa mai i raro. Tutoa mai i roto, tutoa mai i wahu. Kia tau ai te Māori tū, te Māori ora ki te katoa tuturu whakamaua kia tēnā, tēnā, haume hui e tāiki e. Kia ora. Kia ora. Welcome to this live stream from Waikato University around the COP26 conference. Today we'll be focusing on the theme of adaptation and resilience uh, following last night's session at the conference and we have about nine speakers and with a bit of luck we'll have some time at the end for some for, for some uh, kōrero so um, I'd like to hand over to Hamish McDool to open up thank you Nami Nui Ki Kato Katoa Ko Rupeu Toko Maunga, ko Wanganu Te Awa, Tukua Toko Awa, ko Hamish McDool Toko Ingoa, ko Te Koromatua o Te Rohi o Wanganu Toko Mahi. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Hamish McDool. I'm the Mayor of Wanganu and the Vice President of Local Government New Zealand. Resilience and adaptation are two legs of the climate response and something that local government needs to embrace as conversations to have with the communities right now. One of local government's great assets is its ability to know and uh, work with and engage with different sectors of uh, every community within the Rohi boundaries. However, I, I make a, a plea here for mitigation. Uh, the greater the success of mitigation, the lesser the adaptation required, uh, the less that resilience will be stress tested. But the reality is whether the world can keep temperatures to 1.5 or as seems more likely uh, from uh, COP26 uh, 1.9 degrees above pre-industrial levels, there will be radical changes to our environment and changes in our lifestyle. Uh, I recall a farmer uh, who came up to me when I was campaigning uh, for the mayoralty uh, on a, a climate change ticket. Uh, she said, uh, "What are you? Why, why are you wanting to uh, change my lifestyle? And I responded, well, you're changing my lifestyle right now with what you're doing. Hawaka e Kanoa, we're all in this together, uh, we're all connected, and we all must adapt. Now, adaptation I see is uh, adaptation of jobs, adaptation of land use, uh, adaptation uh, to the greater frequency of natural disasters. Uh, you know, what industries are sustainable? What, local, what localities are viable? Uh, adaptation is right across the board, and it's deep. In Wanganui, we're, although we're on the coast, we're actually less vulnerable to coastal inundation. Uh, but around the nation, some $14 billion of council assets are at risk. These are airports, these are wastewater treatment plants, ports, uh, important buildings, they're all vulnerable. There are also some communities that are no longer viable. They might be existing communities that will either fall into the sea in decades as erosion has its way, uh, or will be flooded on such a regular basis that continued existence would be impossible. That may not affect Wanganui, but in Wanganui we uh, are anticipating becoming both wetter uh, and drier uh, and warmer. And when it will be wet, it will be very wet. And when it is dry, it will tend to drought. Storms will be more regular and more intense. So we anticipate more frequent flood events. Uh, the river, uh, in the city has overtopped the stop banks three times in the last 30 years, but there have been another five uh, or so near misses. Uh, when uh, Te Awa uh, overtops uh, the stop banks, some 200 houses and, and many buildings in the CBD get flooded. Um, these include Anzac Parade, which is alongside of one of our beautiful parks, uh, Putuki Marae, and Topo, uh, Topo Key's beautiful uh, Edwardian buildings uh, are also vulnerable. So we, how do we adapt to this? Uh, we must look at the district plan, which is uh, our most powerful tool. That doesn't necessarily mean we should preclude 
living there that we should uh, that managed retreat is the only way. I remember speaking with a potomologist, uh, that's a, a river scientist, a great word, potomologist, and he told me that, you know, don't build higher stop banks, don't manage retreat. Uh, he said, learn to live with the river. Learn to live with the river as they do in Launceston and Tasmania, where uh, a, a whole row of uh, very vintage buildings, great heritage buildings, are built of flood and more materials. So let's not let's not build with jib. Let's uh, build with concrete, and it can just be washed out after the flood and move on. Now, of course, when you try and put things in the district plan, uh, this affects the values of uh, value of property, and that's uh, quite frankly the value of property is entirely a moment of time. In a perfect knowledge, you should, uh, perfect market, you should have perfect knowledge. And uh, I want to acknowledge Kapiti District Council for attempting to do uh, this and put uh, essentially um, putting coastal inundation in the district plan. This was challenged by the current owners because of how that decision would affect the values. Uh, quite frankly, that's short-term thinking. So what, I have to wrap up sadly, and I have to uh, not stay too long. Uh, I've got another meeting I have to go to. Uh, but adaptation also means business. If I am thinking of wet and warmer, I'm thinking blights and facial eczema. I'm thinking some industries will collapse and there'll be, and these might be important industries uh, in Taranaki, for example, these conversations have to start now because there are a lot of people whose economic well-being uh, depends on these industries at the moment. They need to retrain. Last thing, environment is not uh, the wholly owned subsidiary of the economy. It's the other way around. Tenakata, tenakata, tenatata kato. Oh, over to Kepa. Kia ora, Hamish. Hey, huri tēnei. No te kupui o te arawa, ko ngāti piki ao te iwi, ko ngāti te rangi nora e mihi ati nei, tēnā koutou katoa. I am Dr Kepa Morgan and the creator of the Modi Model Decision Making Framework. Modi is the life supporting capacity, Modi box, the physical to everything else that supports life. And I'm just going to turn off Siri. And it uh, facilitates life and everything uh, in our world. My message is this. Mohitanga Aiwi, or Indigenous knowledge, has a unique contribution to make regarding climate change adaptation and increasing resilience. Indigenous ways of knowing have always sought to increase resilience. Kaitiakitanga is about enhancing modi, enhancing the life-supporting capacity of all things, and because of the independence of life, enhancing our own potential for survival. Our tūpuna understood through detailed observation over generations. Indigenous knowledge is location specific, not universal. For example, marae were positioned to reduce the risks posed by natural disasters, but to ensure readily accessible fundamental resources for life, such as fresh water. Marae are located adjacent to freshwater sources, springs, or other secure freshwater sources, because freshwater is not just required for human survival, but is a necessary a necessity for almost all living things to flourish. Freshwater was valued most highly, and ensuring the integrity of the life-giving waters was paramount in our decision making. Our tupuna focused. I'm just going to start up the slides, actually. I forgot. So I hope you can see that. Our tūpuna focused. On what mattered. When you have generations of data from observations and do not rely on written records, your ways of knowing become more sophisticated. Our tūpuna based their observations on the life-supporting capacity of everything around them, measured the life-supporting capacity consistently and focused on the outliers. They allowed appropriate responses to anomalies, harvesting in times of excess abundance and applying constraint or rahui in times of scarcity. The persistent focus 
was to enhance the life supporting capacity of everything around them, leading to resilience. The world we now live in is being destroyed by a disconnection from reality and the forced adoption of different values. Wealth is measured in artificial terms called currency, shares, and Bitcoin. Meanwhile, well being is the elusive goal of the super rich who seem incapable of accumulating enough wealth to be satisfied. Climate change and other forms of dis ease, such as species extinction, deforestation, and biodiversity loss, are the inevitable consequences of this superficial reality and reflect a diminishing global modi. Adaptation is now a necessity for all humankind if survival is going to be the outcome. The challenge is significant for individuals living in a capitalist world. Adaptation represents the loss of the convenience and freedoms previously exploited as the means of capital accumulation. A clear and compelling way of communicating the necessary changes in behavior is needed. Holistic understandings of reality through an indigenous lens are needed. The Modi model decision-making framework was created for this purpose. Returning to the value of our tūpuna and what they placed in terms of value on fresh water. The modi ratio array shown here is a simple representation of how the modi or life-supporting capacity of water is measured. The modi array communicates its message intuitively. At the bottom, the graph shows the cumulative impact on modi. The change in a positive sense is an increase in life-supporting capacity or resilience. In a negative sense is a decrease in life-supporting capacity or increased vulnerability. In the case shown, the result is a reduction in modi over the 30-day period indicated of 0.16 modi months. Conversely, the second example, the cumulative change in modi is an increase in modi of 0.29 modi months at the point shown on the timeline. Homai Tāwhiti instructed the Tiarawa people in his kupu ohak, one line of which is tutua mai te whiwhia mai te rauia. Bind all in the world of light to everything else. It is Modi that binds the physical to all else that facilitates life. Tina koto katoa. And I'm trying to escape. Kapai. Over to you, Mary. Hold up. I think I'm on unmute now. Yes. Kapai. Okay. Unmute myself. I've got some signature on the sign on my screen. I don't know what to do with it. I'll just. Can you see that 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 sign on my screen? I. Unmute myself. Okay. You're okay, Mary. Okay, I'm okay. All right. Kia ora, Ekepa. Um. I'm asking the question, is there something sacred capable of supporting the mana of the tangata whenua in adapting to climate change? And I'm a tangata whenua of the Tai Tōkero, kuku patoku uh, tangata ko merike pahau. And I was disappointed and unhappy when I read about the commitments that New Zealand's representatives took to the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. Seemingly, the government has proposed to meet most of New Zealand's international targets for sequestering carbon by spending $5 billion on restoring forests in other countries. In Aotearoa, where 85% of the land was once covered in native, native forests, the habitat of a multitude of unique species of plants, birds, insects, and reptiles, only 24% of the indigenous land cover remains. Of course, nature has been severely degraded by humans, pest animals, and weeds, over the history of settlement. Contemporaneously, there is a colossal loss of biodiversity with 4,000 indigenous species in danger of loss. Many of the native forests, such as Takahiwai Forest where I live in the Taitokero, are being eaten to death and dying. Consequently, here we set up the voluntary community pest control uh, areas plan 
from 2018 to 2029. And we call this the PEST strategy, which was prepared in July 2018. And the strategy is an informal communion of the owners of the farmland on the forest's edge. The owners are predominantly Indigenous Māori people who are shared owners of individual properties. Most of the Māori share common Māori ancestors. The strategy was formed in response to human activity that has led to the degradation and destruction of the forest and the intrusion by feral pigs onto the private properties, thus affecting our business. As a communal initiative, the strategy has addressed the threat to the pastures in the forest, controlling and monitoring pest animals and plants, as well as helping to prevent the disease Cody dieback. So the changes to have occurred are engaging Māori landowners and interested Pākehā neighbours in pest control, encouragement by Northland Regional Council's biosecurity team, instigating the Rangi Order Bird Project supported by NRC and Kiwi Coast, instigating the pest strategy hunters list, instigating the hunters alert on email, sorry, it's an email warning to the people in Takahiwai of the presence of a pest strategy hunter in the forest, recording the cull observations, sightings and events of significance daily, subject to the weather, disseminating the cull numbers and the observations to the landowners, hunters and volunteers, other interested peoples and organisations monthly and annually, instigating the Waitangi Day community event to engage with interested peoples and organisations sponsored by Kiwi Coast, disseminating environmental activities through the Takahiwai Community Pānui or newsletter, and finally establishing research associations. That's what we've been doing here. In Māori antiquity, the mana of the Tangata Whenua reached Aotearoa on the back of Tangaro Atemoana, guided by the kaitiaki of his sacred realm. Aotearoa is surrounded by Tangaroa Atemoana. From the stream to the ocean, the land can never be severed from the god Tangaroa Atemoana. In the 21st century, still the Tangata Whenua must conform to the Resource Management Act 1991. Technically, the Whakapapa of Te Ao, or the living world, has been severed from Tangaroa Atemoana into a fungible commodity. Individually and collectively, the tongue of the whenua and our money and our mana remain but out of sight. Along the way, the chiefly leadership accustomed to regarding Tangaroa Atimoana as a sacred being rather than a movable, perishable, measured and profitable commodity has been replaced by an iwi authority, a member of parliament, a trust, a consultant or a committee of the local councils. At the local export port, the tangata whenua, our whakapapa, our mana and our kōrero have been diminished to docking, wood chipping operations and log storage. The consequences are a massive disruption of the life of the tangata whenua, human rights abuses and lost carbon storage potential in the ruined natural world. None of the consequences is likely to be visible on the spreadsheet that informs the boardroom. What is not known is not countable. To stave off irre irreversible catastrophe, the Tangata Whenua require an accord with the government based on the principles to respect Indigenous rights, to maintain the sacred landscape and a livable climate. The action is at the heart of our generations long battle to protect Papatuanuku, our Earth Mother, Ranginui, our Sky, sky Father, Tangaroa te Moana, our water father, Rongo, the god of cultivated food, Omiya, the god of wild foods, Tane, the god of the forest, and Tawhiri, the god of the wind and storms from the northeast and future generations. The Tangata Whenua are calling on the government to join us in, in exiting the two worlds of winners and losers now. With insight and research, I suggest climate change has led to a long relationship of adaptation and resilience. Resilience between Western science, meaning truth, and Mātauranga Māori, also meaning truth. From a perspective of Mātauranga Māori, the creatures of the natural world are sacred, 
and valuable in their own right, not simply for science preventing the, and preventing the extinction of one species versus another. In consequence, the Tangata Whenua, our relations and our associated organizations have had to uphold the sacredness of the living world through ceremonies and tapu protecting the earth from anyone and anything that would insult or pollute the sanctity of life. The Tangata Whenua would consequently ensure that the government and industrialists proposed technologies do not contaminate nature. That is for us a living being. The door to that accord lies in opening up dialogue from the forest to the harbour about pesticides, pharmaceutical residues, industrial chemicals and diverse waste that will threaten planetary well-being. Just as much as deforestation and greenhouse gas, gas emissions, nature is life. What the government and the industrialists do to life, they will do to all life on the planet. Ultimately, Elevating the voice of the Tangata Whenua alongside the voice of young people and children will portray the critical role of the notions of adaptation and resilience and public empowerment and education in climate change. No reira, ka mahinu. I'm next. Peter, signal if that's wrong. Okay, kia ora. Um, yeah, I'd just like to acknowledge the Tangata Whenua um, and the previous speakers, uh, Kepa and Mere, Kia ora Eho, Mere. Um, my name's Marcus Williams. I'm speaking from Tamaki Makoto, uh, Auckland, the largest city in New Zealand, which sits on the boundaries, the northern boundaries of the Waikato. Kia ora. Um, I, uh, at the, the city that I live in, um, it has about 1.5 million people in it, um, was, had the regional councils merged into a, a, what we call a super city about 10 years ago. Um, and at that time, the formation of the community boards occurred. Um, and some time ago, um, oh, about a year ago, I was asked to consult on the plan for the community board in the part of Auckland that I live in. Um, and my feedback was that there was a lack of vision and resource to empower leadership at community level. And that is my contrib contribution to this kaupapa today, is that uh, local body authorities and government, central government as well, need to be thinking about how we grow the capacity at community level um, with respect to resilience uh, in terms of climate change. Um, I think Mede has spoken eloquently about um, the power of that potential, and I know about her work in Takahiwai in the Taitokirau. Um, and there are many examples of this, and uh, I think that the Mo, the, the, the modi that Kepa speaks of, the values and the relationship with Taiao and, um, and the environment that is embedded in Te Ao Māori uh, is, is a lesson for all of us. But the model is there as well in terms of the national network of marae that uh, sit in communities and provide the opportunity for communities to work together uh, in respect to resilience with respect to climate change. And I think there's a, a, a terrific model there, um, which we as a nation don't value enough and we need to support that um, and we need to learn from it and we need to replicate it because it's a powerful model and it's a powerful value structure so that's my corridor. I'll finish there, Peter, and uh, kia ora koutou. Can you unmute, Max?
Sorry, there we go. Apologise for that. Well, kia ora tato. Um, I was asked to uh, be on this panel to uh, to talk of regenerative farming, and it, I think it's about the third or fourth time I've been asked to do that. Oh, uh, it's 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 been um, the third or fourth time I've been asked to talk of regenerative farming, which always brings up the problem of of, of defining what it is. And I've always said I'm not sure what regenerative farming is, but I've got a pretty good idea now after 40 years of some regenerative practices. But I will attempt to say this, that it's nothing if it's not grounded in soils and diversity and root depths and the fungal connections of life uh, that, 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 that extend much further than the roots that you see. The fungal connections are much deeper and wider and, and that's connection with Papa Tuhanuku and the uh, is is what we're attempting to expand on. So we need to expand those connections with plants and us on the surface. And I have to say after many years of trying to understand this and look and scratching the surface on that, uh, I have to say the more you look, the more you look at life in this context, the more you see that every living thing on the surface are really merely solar collectors and fruiting bodies for the fungal world, which do run everything down there with the uh, interconnectedness of the supply chains, you know, if you're looking at it from a science perspective. But I'm entirely with Mary and uh, the Māori Māori world view on this. It's uh, it's the interconnectedness of life is what we're missing out on. Um, I, I, I was very taken with the... I'm very taken with this morning's session on the uh, everyone's complaining about the, 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 the cop not getting there, etc. But this morning I saw Antonio Guterres' uh, viewpoint of nature-based nature solutions having to take the floor. And I was so pleased about that because there's a bunch of us that have been trying to get that up here as well and remove ourselves from the dogma that we think we know with the sciences and get on to get on to the uh, natural solutions and look very closely at what they do because it's, it's nature that stores carbon. It's nature that, that, sh that stores water. And it's nature that cools the earth with the water cycles and the hydro cycles and the, and the interconnectedness between the outer edge of our atmosphere and down as deep as we, we've been able to explore with our puny little drills in the earth. It's all there. And so uh, that, that cycle of that and uh, direct cooling that we can do with that and the way in which we can explore and play with that on the surface as a farmer sort of matters to me and so that's i'm hoping that that the next patch of play for aotearoa is that we spend much much more time looking closely in that direction and i was taken this morning by listening to the maldives who said that there'd been a hundred billion had been uh, promised for adaptation but hadn't been spent and I thought, good God, you know, that's just what the adaptation. And uh, I was taken with, with the African fellow who said, when it rains, Africa cries. When there's a drought, Africa cries. And that uh, mitigation, adaptation and resilience were three sides of the same coin. And I'm with that. I think they're all there in that solution for us. And I would argue that we would ask that we, if we're looking at it, look at the extremes. Have a look at what Vijay Kumar's doing in, in uh, Google it. Have a look at Vijay Kumar in, uh, in uh, Andhra Pradesh in India, what they're doing with the direct cooling there and supplying food, changing the climate, harvesting the rivers of water over the land and improving people's lives all in one, one hit. It's quite dramatic. So go look there. We get those extremes. The other one that I was taken with this morning was the Blue Carbon Initiative because that we can look at it for ourselves that easily, you know. It's planting mangroves, so you've got action. We can do something, get on with it. And you get protection, and you get carbon capture, and you get the beautiful view of, of, uh, of we have the uh, cooling, cooling in the intertidal zone. And so we, we've got things we can do. And as farmers, um, I'm very aware that the methane question is up for an argument, but... Uh, it's, it's a 78% variability there, and it's the cycle of life. But let's get on with getting rid of the nitrous oxide and the in inputs of nitrogen. Let's, let's see if we can't get ourselves out of the palm kernel. 
Let's see if we can't get out of turning the ground. Let's guess if we can't get out of chasing pathology as the only way forward instead of ch chasing, chasing the interconnectedness of life when it gets a chance to do something and look after us all. So there, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank, thank you, Max. Uh, look, my name's Rick Lefty, and I'm just going to share my screen. I do have some some slides to to share with you. Uh, coincidentally, uh, the previous speaker and this current speaker um, have come from the same little town in the Haraki Plains, um, at which you can see here uh, what the Karuru is down through here. And this is just showing our Regional Council Coastal Inundation Tool. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that uh, just in a minute. So I'm just going to share my screen. There we go. I'm Team Leader of Regional Resilience at Waikato Regional Council. Uh, the picture there that you can see there is uh, the settlement of Kayawa. Uh, and the water you see there is from the, the Firth of Thames uh, on a king tide. Snowstorm, that's where the water gets to on a king tide. So it doesn't take too much imagination to see what the potential challenges uh, this community has in the future with even a small amount of sea level rise. So following on for what Hamish talked about this morning uh, at, the start of this, uh, at the start of this little session uh, is what can we do about it and, and what role does local and central government have? And I've, I've got a list of three key challenges that, um, that we need to, to focus on. And the first one is very simply the roles and responsibilities. And for, the, for our communities and for the public and even ourselves in local and central government um, to know what does a district council do? What does a regional council do? And what does, a, what does central government do as well? We all have different roles and responsibilities and they all mesh in together. But how do we work together effectively to make sure we are working together and we are getting these goals that, um, that we, want to, uh, we, we want to aspire to. But for the public who we need to be engaging with and we are engaging with, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of misconceptions around what local government does. And so that's a first barrier that we need to try and demystify uh, and provide some clarity around what we do to then be able to go forward and actually make some change. As part of the, the understanding of what we do as, a, as, as local government and central government, it's also getting right down to that community level and understanding what's the risk. Understanding what the risk is and how as a community we can then incorporate and increase our resilience to that, to that risk. And risk comprises uh, the components of the hazard, how that hazard impacts uh, on the exposure, what gets affected, and the vulnerability of our communities. And that all comes together in terms of of understanding what that risk is. If we understand what that risk is, then we can start to implement change to make sure that the risk is acceptable. Move away from being intolerable. Um, we can work with being tolerable and live with some, some risk and live with some impacts, but to get back to where we were as quickly as possible. That's challenge two. I'll, I'll explain a little bit more of this in, in, a, in a few minutes. But then, once we know, you know some of this information around uh, our, our communities, the risks, uh, and how we want to be resilient, how do we implement that change? And Hamish mentioned it before, you know, when you're trying to identify places of, of that have a hazard or have a risk, immediately a lot of people think uh, about their value on their property. All right, but as for the previous speakers that, we, that, we've, that we've had, Mary and Kipa, uh, what is the value? All right. Is it financial? Is it, is, it, is it social? Is it environmental? We need to understand what those different risks are and how they, how they are impacted on our four values of, of financial, environmental, social, uh, and um, I've forgotten the last one. Um, so we need a cultural. So we need to make, make, make sure that we are uh, understanding what those risks are and how, we, how do we implement change. And a big part of that is, again, understanding what your your thresholds are. At what point do you go, no, that's enough. We're not going to tolerate that. That's intolerable. All right, how do we move to that tolerable level and how do we move to being acceptable? Now, that's your threshold. It's our threshold and, and that changes. People's thresholds differ. So we need to be quite clear around what that, that is. And for that to happen, we do need to work together. No doubt about that. Um, iwi, central government, regional council, 
uh, territorial authorities, the community, stakeholders, we all need to, to work together on this. We need to understand what it means to be resilient. We need to make some, some pretty tough choices around competing values and levels of risk. But we need that statutory framework for all this to fit into. And I know there's some uncertainty around those statutory frameworks coming forward, so we need to be able to address those when they, when they come out. Um, but there needs to be a, a bottom-up and top-down approach. The so bottom-up is the community, the hapu, the, 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 the marae, coming up, feeding this information up, but also central government providing the, you know, the, the, the resources to be able to actually implement some of this work. We're on a journey together, all right? We're all learning, all right? And we're not there yet, all right? We don't have all the answers, but we do have some pretty good information already. We have some pretty good structures and frameworks, and there's some new ones coming on with some of the RMA reforms that we have. So let's build on what we've got. And it's really encouraging to hear the previous speakers around what we've already got and where we need to be, be, with, um, be, be at. And we are already down that track as well. And I mentioned before Kaiawa, uh, and Haraki D, uh, District Council are leading uh, the Farukawa Coast 2120 project uh, that is working with communities and that's been a real success so far. We've got really good engagement there. The community is getting behind some of this information and changes uh, that we need to implement uh, and understanding it. Thames Coromandel District Council, the shoreline management plan work uh, and also Wakato District Council with Port Waikato. Um, so we're in a much better space. We're in, we've got some great, great frameworks but we need to keep going. Um, and look, that's my time, but uh, I'm sure there'll be some more kororo at the, at the end of this as well. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, so now we have uh, Amanda. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Amanda Waitere Ahau. Um, I'm a work with Global Vital Solutions Limited. Um, it's a Māori business um, and we're working in a recycling space, recycling scrap metal. Um, we export um, about 300 containers a month of metal to Southeast Asia, where it's sent to secondary steel mills and it's turned into secondary steel products. Um, that process, that secondary steel processing is a much more environmentally friendly process than the creation of virgin um, metal. And so um, we're pretty um, proud to be working in this space and making a contribution um, to the environment. Um, we're also a, a business that is um, not only predominantly Māori owned, but we also have 80% of our employees in Māori. And we have been working on interweaving um, Mātauranga Māori into our business practices. And so um, it's a unique position to be in to be trying to reconcile um, you know, business practices and business viability and sustainability and profit with um, practices um, around um, being uh, sustaining the environment um, as best we can. Um, and so um, one of the ways that we do that is we, um, we're trying to set standards within our industry um, in relation to environmental practices. And, um, and one of the ways that we've done that is we have um, obtained ISO accreditations, which are international um, self-imposed accreditations, and one of those accreditations is an environmental accreditation. Um, I just want to um, acknowledge that, and, and I'm really pleased to be able to acknowledge this general consensus that the panel seems to have about the relevance and the importance of um, Māori concepts relating to kaitiakitanga and the environment. Um, you know, as, as a Māori business, we, we find these uh, concepts inspirational. We need to help guide us in our decision making and they, they give us a, a goal to work towards. And, um, you know, I, Max referred to in his corridor about the um, interconnectedness of life, and that's just such a profound statement, right? And um, for us, um, working in, I suppose, a practical industry space, one of the challenges that we have is an interconnectedness challenge as well, I think, and that is in the, the ability to try and connect our principles and what we're trying to achieve with policy and legislation and, and making those things real and making them 
as important to the people that we work with as they are to us. And when I'm referring to the people we work with, I'm referring to those the parties that we work with regularly, like local council and, and central government and those sorts of um, organisations. And um, because it's really nice to talk about these things, and we all love to talk about these things, but in practice, what do they actually mean? How do how do, how how do we realise them in a way that we they are valuable that we can say that we can entrench these principles um, in, 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 into our businesses and into our policy and into our legislation and actually make them real. Um, and I, that's one of the challenges that, that we have faced, you know. Um, we need more to work with in that space, you know. Um, also, I think, that, you know, from a Māori perspective, there's an issue for us around the importance of fertility. And that, um, you know, and, and, and that being a basis for our participation as Māori in important decision making around these climate change issues and um, in conversations around uh, initiatives about climate change. So, you know, the in, in this lack of connectedness is um, it's confusing and discouraging at times, to be honest. Um, when you're sort of trying to, to you're saying, hey, look, we're working really hard. We've got, we're trying to do good things, but um, where's the support? Because as a business, we're about outcomes. It's not enough to, to have to work to good principles and, and have these values. We have to, we have to achieve outcomes. And, and for us, those outcomes are obtaining additional support so that we can expand and improve what we're doing, so that we can recycle more material, so that we can improve the way that we recycle more the material, make it more um, carbon emission friendly, and, and, and then support obviously our, our whānau and our communities through employment and through sharing these values. Um, we also um, partner with um, our whānau in the Pacific as well and um, to help them to manage their um, waste. So that involves recycling scrap metal, which we import um, here into New Zealand, and then helping them also manage um, their plastics and cardboards. Um, so um, I think it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, I suppose, an interesting tension there at Pines, as I already said. But, you know, the thing is, as Māori, we are, we are resilient we already and we can use those skills and apply them to this climate change issue. We have been adapting for hundreds of years and we can use those skills to and apply them to this climate, these climate change issues. We just need, I think, better pathways or clearer pathways to be able to participate. Um, we're fortunate because we have this business vehicle and we're able to generate income and be successful with what we do. That opens doors for us. But for other um, groups in the community, they don't have those vehicles. And um, so I just want to um, thank everybody for, for coming here today and participating. And yeah, as I said, really pleased to hear that people um, are supportive of, um, of, of uh, Māori perspectives on these issues and really hoping that if we can um, keep that momentum going, that we can um, start um, interweaving and ingraining some of these things into into these spaces where it really counts, as I said, which is policy and legislation and um, things like that. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora tata, te, te kaikara kia kepa. Uh, Tēnā koe, a kepa, te tainui waka, tēnā, tēnā, tēnā koutou, ngā mihi, ngā mihi, uh, e ngā mā tā waka, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, John Barrett toko unua, uh, aukua, ngā te rakua ki te tonga, uh, te atu awa, 
na tituo ranga tira toku iwi. Tēnā koe. Greetings to everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I'm pretty sure that I'm the least prepared speaker uh, in this in this uh, forum today, and I'm here because New Zealand Māori Tourism has asked me to be here through our Komatua Tom Law, and I'm here, I think, to present a, a view that uh, the tourism sector and Māori tourism uh, is an interested party uh, in this corridor and in this kaupapa. Uh, just just like everybody else in, in this corridor today is a is a very interested party. Um, and although I'm not well prepared, uh, here we are. And look, I just want to say that the corridor up to this point has been just great. And if I had prepared well for this um, for this forum, I think I would have had a little bit of everything that's been said so far in my corridor and everything that's been said so far has got relevance to the way we feel and the way we operate um, as a sector and as, as a business. Our own business, um, I should say, I'm, I'm sitting out here at Kapiti Island at the moment. Our, our business is a small ecotourism business based on Kapiti Island, uh, a Fado business. We're a, we're a kaupapa based business. We operate our business strictly according to uh, many of those kaupapa that have been talked about already uh, today, Manaki Tanga, Kaitiaki Tanga, Whanaunga Tanga, uh, Rangatira Tanga, uh, Kotahi Tanga, are all part. Um, we don't do anything in our business without reference back to one of those tangas that have been um, ground into us so, over the years. Um, but I'm also speaking uh, with an ear uh, and, and on behalf of another organisation uh, that we're heavily involved with, and that's uh, an international indigenous tourism alliance. And through my involvement with that organisation, uh, I hear firsthand of the issues and the tribulations that affect tribes in Lapland and in the USA and Canada and Africa and South America in the Himalaya uh, and of course our brothers and sisters uh, in the Pacific, uh, which we hear about uh, to, a, to a much uh, greater and growing level. And so those issues from around the, around the globe uh, resonate really clearly with, with us. They should actually uh, resonate with us as uh, citizens of Aotearoa but, and also of Māori uh, across Aotearoa because they're the same, same issues that we, we're also grappling with. Um, but for, for this, this kaupapa, this particular kaupapa, and I, I might go off, um, off the reserve here from time to time, but um, for our little business, for example, we're, we're greatly concerned about, about the impacts and effects of climate change. Uh, even in a very localised area like Kapiti Island, we're seeing the impacts uh, through, through greater and more severe events of weather, dry and wet. And of course, that, that impacts on the environment that we live in. We live in a fantastically natural and uh, thriving uh, environment. Uh, the Nahiri is just flourishing and the Manu is it's, it's the best, I think, in Aotearoa. But we're seeing signs of that. We're seeing signs of wilting. We're seeing signs of reduced uh, water supply. We're seeing um, change in uh, the marine environment. We're seeing all those things that you've been talking about today um, and over the course of, of this uh, COP22 um, event. So they're real, they're real things. Uh, they're not, they're not, not, not academic uh, exercises for us. These things are, are real, just like they are, they are for all of Aotearoa, all of the, all of the globe, in fact. So I've got some, I've made some points that I think uh, I just want to hang my corridor around. Um, and and for us, for example, in our little business, it's, it's we we focus on um, mobilising. Uh, the collective energy and commitment of our whānau our, and our extended whānau and our community to do everything we can to um, to reduce our personal impact on the environment. Now, I know this isn't um, directly talking to the, the kaupapa for today, the, the, the mitigation and uh, res um, resilience kaupapa, but uh, I, I'm, I've got to say I'm, I'm more concerned about uh, 
reduction rather than mitigation and um, resilience. I mean, I, I take the point from previous speakers that we are resilient people. We, we will make adjustments. But my, my core it all really hangs around why the hell should we be, we, why shouldn't we be going to the source and putting much, much more energy into the actions we can take to, re, to reduce the impact, to reduce the effects, rather than look, look at the adaption strategies. Sure, well, we do need to, to look at adaption, but I just want to make sure that we get the, the pro rata right uh, and don't, don't move away from um, move away from activities that reduce our impact. So as I say, gathering and mobilizing collective energy uh, to help reduce our personal impact on the environment is where we start in our, in our little business, in our little hapu, in, a, in our little community on Kapiti Island. And, and the other issue that's become quite apparent to me is understanding that there is still a very, very significant part of our community, of our whānau, of our population, uh, that aren't participating in this corridor, and they need to be participating. And I heard that coming through some of the earlier discussion this morning about collective collectiveness and take bringing on communities. Uh, but look, I, I don't want to be part of a community talking amongst ourselves. Um, we, we need to be part of it. Well, I don't want to be part of a community that's actually doing something, and I want to know how best to mobilise us all to to do that. I mean, I, I liken our our current. Um, that this current uh, climate change corridor to the to the COVID corridor, uh, we aren't all on the same page, and you know, in some instances, we're not even in the same book um, uh, for this particular corridor. We need to be doing something about us. So the, the little things that we we are able to do uh, in our own business and in our own uh, hapu in our own community, we we do just very basic and and minimalistic things like minimal fuel use, uh, and we can do that effectively, less vehicle use, um, total reliance on solar energy at our facility, minimum use of energy hungry appliances, all these things that I, I'm pretty sure that we all try and do to the best of our ability, uh, at least the people on this, on this forum do that. Uh, and that's great, but you know, it, in themselves are just not enough in my opinion. We, we do need to act more not talk more about action. Um, and I have to say, I agree somewhat with the Thornburg uh, corridor that there's just too much corridor and absolutely not enough action to change our, and I'm talking about our whānau, our hapu in our community uh, and our national business as usual model. And again, in, in my view, it really has to change immediately, not, uh, you know, now I've clocked up 75 years, and I'm pretty happy about that, but to, to to be able to look back in 30 years' time and, and see us still having the same corridor, man, I'd be pretty disappointed in, in if that was going to be the case. We just don't have that luxury, in my opinion. Um, who's going to drive the change? Is it, is it academia? Is it local government? Um, well, you probably all say that you, you have a part to play in that. Uh, our government approach to me is not meeting the national expectation. The government needs to be more undemocratic, in my opinion. Uh, it needs to do what it needs, it knows needs to be done. Um, even at the risk of a popularity decline, it's it's just the risk is just the risk and delaying is just too great to uh, to allow ourselves the luxury of more talk uh, in this in this issue. Um, are we prepared to make major and significant changes? Uh, I, I sometimes uh, um, despair that we're not. I, I often despair that we're not prepared to make the major changes that will help us get through this this process with the minimal amount of damage uh, to uh, to Papatūnuku and, and ourselves. Not only to Fano, kanu to me, kanu to Korero. Uh, well, kia ora koutou. thank you for the preceding speakers. Uh, I won't share my slides. Um, I'll just share a very quick idea from them, and that is that one of the one of the things and we need to be concerned about in terms of resilience is is our taitamariki, our young people. And uh, some work I did a little earlier looks at two dimensions of that. Um, the important thing is hope. 
they need to have hope. If they have, if they're just driven by fear, that will mean that they'll just disengage, and turn off. Now, how do they have hope? According to what I've what I've studied, um, it's about a sense of agency, a sense of being able to do something about the problem, and seeing pathways of action. So I think for them to pick up the the baton, it means it means that we need to be leading with practical and um, some of the methods, some of the things that you've all been talking about today. And uh, we we have another five minutes, so it would be let's see how it goes if we unmute everybody unmutes and we have a bit a bit of corridor about this. Pick up on some of the ideas. Um, there was a strong thread there on the value of the natural world, for example, in um, both supporting adaptation and mitigation. Uh, Mark has talked about the importance of community, and what's come through was all the tangas, uh, the importance of mataranga Māori in informing this, not being secondary to science, but being a partner. So any any thoughts, please? Yes. <laughs> all of the above, Peter. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll... Uh, just just um, picking up on your comment, Peter, about our youth needing to have hope. I I agree totally. I think it's unfair to place the responsibility and the burden of the future on their shoulders without providing them with the tools and empowering them in the decision making framework to make a difference. So I, I totally agree. I think the idea that this coming generation will solve all the problems is really quite unfair. Mm. Um, totally support what you said. Yeah, a, there is another small po point about that, and that is the focus internationally has been sadly so fixated on the marketplace fixing it with some sort of carbon marketplace. Mm -hmm. And when we move over to our world, the biological world, it's just a nonsense. They haven't yeah. been able to get any international price on ca carbon, and they're unlikely to. Last time Trump wasn't here, wasn't at the party, and this year we've got uh, we've got China and Russia out there, and so let's mm. just don't we forget about that and get and get on with engaging our tamariki with with these things that we know that we can do, you know. Get yeah. the, what, what's in our agency, and that is those st those community driven stuff. And so for me, that's the way forward, is because there is hope. We can mm. we can do stuff. One one of the challenges we've we've had um, as you know as, as local authorities is engaging with community, and we've been quite lucky with with a number of the community groups that we have. But it, it becomes very apparent is to get you know the the full demographic within a community. Um, it's it's the time, it's the resources. You know, people people yeah. are busy. People have young families. They have jobs, yeah. and then and then we expect them to. Uh, want to be uh, engaging in, the, in these in these projects, and um, it's hard. It's really really hard. So we we need to have some way where we can engage, but also, you know, how do we not make this process onerous for them as well? Because that's that's a big put off for a lot of people as well. It just it gets too hard. And I'm not being defeatist, but it, that's practicalities involved there. Yeah. Um a good point, Rick, and, and I enjoyed your um, presentation and good work that you're doing there too. And I, I do acknowledge that it's difficult. Um, and But I think with respect to um, local boards and, and district councils and local body authorities in general, that um, there are motivated um, cohorts who have resources of time. And, and some of those are rangatahi, they are young people. Um, and so, yeah, we, we need to um, encourage you to, to um, look for those and, 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 and then look at developing um, their leadership potential because they can, they can do a lot. Communities can do a great deal once you activate them. Kilda. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Yeah, that, yeah and you, know, you get a good community panel or good community group and and that's the hardest part done i'm just pointing out that you know trying to get these people crowd together can be quite a difficulty mm. sometimes mm. yeah rick, rick you need to just see yourself as a forerunner yeah, this work was wasn't beginning when you were a child here we were still doing the reverse around here okay they were yeah. still spraying all the rivers with d4d so we've moved a long way and to see you sitting there 
having doing this work, work now we get the acceptability of the wider collective political world and away we go. You seldom know you're in a revolution when you're having one. And there's never been a, and there's never been a COVID, COVID uh, or a uh, a pandemic go through this globe without there being major social and structural change off the back of it. And that's what we're looking at. Milk it to death, my man. Yeah. Oh, and and we are on. A, you know, there is change happening, and we are on a journey, and and that journey sort of yes. never stops. It's just a matter of, you know, making sure we're we're picking up people along the way to carry on that journey. Well, Kia ora, that's probably a, a very good point to close on. Um, Dr. Morgan, could I ask you to close this occasion, please? And thank you again to everybody for your input. Hi. Kia ora tato. Great session. Um, I'll close this with karakia. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia turu tapu nui atane. Kia o mama, kia o atea, te hiningaro, te tinana, te ngākau, me te wairua ki te ara takatū. E rungo, whakairia ki ki runga. Kia o atea, kia o atea, aira, ko o atea, tuturu whakamaua kia tēnā, tēnā, haumi a hui e tāi. Tāi e. The University of Waikato is proud to introduce the world's first Bachelor of Climate Change. For the people who know there is no Planet B, gain the skills needed for the jobs of tomorrow. Contribute to a fundamental shift in the way we do business and go about our lives. Explore how Matauranga Māori can bring perspective to the most pressing issue of our time. Apply now and carve a career where passion and purpose collide.